All right, everybody, thanks for coming. I always get put after one of the most amazing speakers. First it was Chris Lemma, then it was James Laws. Man, it's not fair, it's not fair. Uh, if you're somebody who is starting an agency, raise your hand. If you already have a well-established agency, raise your hand. Please leave. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so this talk is called The Seven Lessons, and I'm notorious for coming to a WordCamp, having my presentation finished, talking to people at the WordCamp, and then changing it the night before. Uh, I thought of that last night, and some friends and I were sitting around the table. You know what all just comes down to just add some zeros to the end of the invoice? No, nah, maybe don't do that. No, maybe add some more zeros. No, maybe we shouldn't do that either. Maybe we should just keep adding more zeros and just see where this takes us. OMFG, why did we get into this in the first place? And it sort of just comes down to, let's get a plan, right? One thing I like to ask, uh, I, this is where I get sort of theoretical with some of this stuff, is who are we and where do we want to go? How many people just want to build a boutique agency? Six, 12, 20 people maybe, the max. That's where I'm at, six person shop. I really like to have control over the team and the size of the team. How many people want to build sort of a high powered agency? 10 up, web dev, nice, awesome. Where else does anybody, I didn't see all the hands raised. So <laughs> what other agencies are there? Awesome, two people. So a little bit of a warning, and this might resonate with some of you, is I'm not a developer, I'm not a designer. I don't play one on TV. I grew up selling cars, and my co-founder of my agency is my father, who spent 40 years selling cars. So I say this because there's an emotional thing. There's a, can I really do this thing, right? So when I started my agency, so did Jake Goldman of Tenup. He and I were working on the same projects at the same time. We helped each other out a little bit. Jake Goldman has 160 people working for him. I have six, right? So I say that because I want folks to realize that you could be like me and feel like, boy, I just, I just don't measure up to the Jake Goldmans or the web devs of the world, and that's okay. I also say this because this is from my own perspective. My own perspective. You might not use everything I say today in your own agency, but I hope you do. I know I said there's seven lessons. Really, there's only one for me. And it's building the relationship with the client. It's not the features. It's not, are we using WordPress or not? Are we using REST API or not? What theme are we going to use? All the business, 90% of the business, I should say, 90% of the business is all built off of the relationship that we've nurtured with our clients. Still, the number one way to get business for us is word of mouth. It's referral. They like this. We like them. They referred us to another uh, another client in their vertical. So it's super important uh, to pursue the relationship. How I'm gonna structure this talk today is I'm gonna show you a slide deck that I actually present to clients who I know will have pricing problems with our uh, proposal, right? We're still in the range of 50-50 where People aren't just saying, yes, here's our money, back the Brinks truck up to our agency door, take whatever you want, and we'll just build the project. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. I still have to hustle, beat the streets, knock on doors, and a lot of folks are adverse to spending money. What a big surprise. And the talk that I actually give to my incoming client is, hello, my name is Profit, right? We explain to them that we're a profitable agency and why that's important, and what that means to them. Sometimes, what I'll do is if we have a local client, is I'll do this. Very similar to this graph. So if I have this dollar, 80% of this dollar goes to building my client's product, right? So I will tell the client, when we price this stuff, uh, like James was talking about, if you were here earlier, all the overhead, marketing, expenses, payroll, all of that stuff is built into our price. Right? A lot of folks don't get that for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't understand why. Just because we're punching pixels, they don't think there's a real cost. But I'll say that 20% of this goes to profit. 20 cents goes to profit, right? It varies, of course, per project. 
but to, se to sell the idea of we're real business, right? There are real costs associated with this. And if you drive down my profitability, there are certain areas, there are, we get to a point where we cannot be a run profitable business, which means we can't support you. We won't be around any longer, right? Again, 90% of our clients need us there after the project is done. That's actually where we make the most business. That's where we make the most money. Support contracts, ongoing support, iterative, iterative development. So what I'll explain to my client is the more scope creep we get, <laughs> or the, the more uh, diverse we get away from the original uh, purpose of the project, the more you're bringing down my profit, right? It's so obvious, but so not obvious to clients a lot of the time. So I like to have this discussion to just explain to them, the, the more you bring this down, the harder it is for us to work together. Are we a square peg in a round hole? Do we even fit our model of business? Your team, my team, your project, can, can we handle this project? We, we like to spend time to make sure that they understand that we, have a good, we can have a good relationship and everything is thumbs up before we even get to scoping the work, right? And when I do this, like I said, I grew up in car sales, and you know when people can either afford something or they can't, or they're not gonna be the right fit on the car that they're purchasing, they really don't like the color. So this comes over time that you kind of hone this skill, but it's so important that you don't listen to clients and they say, well, how fast can you get this done, right? How cheap can we do this? Or my favorite is, my last developers left on me. I, you know, it was their problem. They just didn't want to do the project anymore. Those were all red flags, right? Because immediately you start to say things like, I need to add more zeros to the end of this estimate, right? So will we be a good fit? Will we be able to communicate, right? Some, some clients will want phone support. They don't want to do email, right? They don't want to be put into a project management system, right? If, these, if this is not how you've structured your business, uh, be wary of that. Make sure that all lines of communication are open. So a lot of people we talk about, a lot of folks who talk about project management, we talk about sort of all the mi major milestones. Well, you got to make sure you do discovery right, so you get a good estimate and you can plan the project correctly. In the middle, sometimes we have to make sure that we're doing the work correctly. We're presenting wireframes the right way. We're doing Q&A the right way. Make sure we're hitting goals. Uh, and the deliverable, you know, do we actually get the project right? Can we train them correctly? Do we do it on time? But what I found over the course of eight years of doing this is everything, ha everything that goes wrong happens in the middle of those milestones, right? And the number one way to squash that is to keep uh, open lines of communication with the customer. Because a lot of the times we'll go, yeah, it's a milestone meeting. Uh, we finished the mock-ups, what do you think? Oh, it's great, just change this color blue to this color blue. Okay, we'll be back, we'll talk to you in a week. And then a week goes by and they're, they're wondering, hey, what's going on? Are you actually doing the work, right? It's filling these gaps. I don't have a perfect method for it, but it's filling these gaps with stand-up meetings. Um, Envision app is a great app that we use to demonstrate our mock-ups and the client can sort of iterate on top of it. Um, but keeping these, knowing that these channels, these pockets in the project is where a lot of communication is lost. This is my favorite slide, and one that really sort of opens up the eyes to the customer, is here's what we see in a project, right? So we see the intake, we see the discovery. We wanna learn their business, who's on their team, what is their process like? Then there's the actual work, like we gotta get it done, right? <laughs> Developers and designers and project managers have to be deployed on this project to actually get it done. Then there's the testing, browser testing, feature testing, Q&A walkthrough, training. And then there's the long-term support, or then there's the long term, which is support. Uh, will we be around 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, a whole year to continue to iterate on whatever this project is? And all the while, the client only sees the leaky faucet, right? Why can't I just hire somebody to fix this thing and you can be off and on your way? So this is the big uh, bird's eye view of what really changes uh, the perception of how valuable a project is. Somewhere in the middle of this, there's the balancing act of project management, what the client wants, what they actually need, and what are the goals of the project, right? And that's the number one thing that we try to outline in every project. What is the goal, right? 
Because Mr. or Mrs. Executive, it's not the color blue that you like or how big your logo is. It's the goal of the project. So if you're trying to get more conversions, trying to sell more product, trying to grow an email list, um, those are the real goals for the users of the website. But all the while, we're balancing you know, the corporate decision or the group decision of the color blues and the logos and that kind of thing. And that sometimes will, their, their wants will sometimes outweigh the needs. So we try to let them know up front with a slide like this that we're really doing this for the project, for the user. Not just because your nieces, nephews, cousins, next door neighbor who builds websites said this is the way it should be done and that looks better. It's also important to let them know that software and development is never 100%. We're never going to get to this level where everything is checked off, all the I's are crossed, all, or all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed, because it's versions, right? It's iterations. They have lofty goals that you simply can't afford right now. So if we're doing this in phases or if we're doing this in sort of iterative development, we're letting them know that not everything is complete right out of the gate. Not everything should be, right? Every, sometimes they'll come to us with a plan that's going to change halfway through. They're going to go into a new sales cycle, and things are going to change for their business. So they shouldn't expect it to be future-proof, which is a great line that we get a lot. Right? We want to build a site that's future-proof. We don't want to invest in it anymore. We just want to build it once, and it's done. It's impossible, <laughs> right? It's impossible. We're always going, uh, clients will always need to reinvest. Something that's never 100% either is the engagement with the relationship with the client. People come and go in your agency, people come and go in their business, right? Making sure that they know it's human beings dealing with human beings, not just robots, right? Not just laborers. Which leads to trusting both sides, right? And that's the number one thing that we underline in a project, in a discovery, in a pre-sales call, and I just ask them, do you trust us, right? Do you like what I'm saying? Do you like the referrals that we've had from past clients that I've put you in connection with? Because if you don't trust us, it's going to be a hard road, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but we don't finish large multi-scale sites in one week. It's 90 days. It's 120 days. Even the smallest five-page site can go 120 days. That's a long-term relationship, right? We're going to be talking to each other for a while. Let's hope we like each other, right? Let's hope we trust each other. Some of the ways we combat this, does anybody have an onboarding plan? Jeez, <laughs> gotta get an onboarding plan. <laughs> so what I've walked through right now is a slideshow that is part of the onboarding plan. And when we onboard customers to our agency, we're letting them know how we operate, right? Again, I've seen 90% of freelancers and boutique agencies, that somebody sends an RFP out, we go and we build the proposal, we say it's $20,000, we email it to them and we say, good luck, let me know what you think. That sucks, right? That sucks. Not only because I came from car sales where you're actually closing the deal in an office, I take your keys, you can't go, you can't leave, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you, you need to have those discussions. It's not fair to your business and the time that you put in because con writing contracts and proposals sucks. It sucks. So why spend all that time and just email it off and say, you know, good luck. Let me know, let me know when you want to send me the deposit, right? So you need to have this onboarding system. It's also important that a majority of customers don't know what's going on behind the scenes, right? I made the reference to the leak, uh, leaky faucet before in a plumber. People can just go to the plumber and just watch them do it, right? I can see what you're doing. That doesn't happen in our world. Although I received an RFP the other day, and the requirement was over-the-shoulder screen sharing. <laughs> and I, there's no way that's going to happen. And the list of requirements was, it had to be like seven paragraphs with bullet points. And, but number one was over-the-shoulder screen sharing. And I said, no thank you. And he said, thanks for your honesty. Can you tell me why? And I said, because nobody's going to do over-the-shoulder screen sharing <laughs> with you on the project. Right? It's just not going to happen. Um, so we're opening the eyes of what goes on behind the scenes. How many people have solid contracts? God, I better see those hands. Yeah, now you're all afraid. You just want to raise hands, right? <laughs> so I should take a step back and say that 
like business, this is all agile, right? This whole process, this onboarding, contract building, this is stuff that you have to realize is always in motion for yourself, right? I've had, I don't know, 10 contract versions uh, over our eight year span. Like this stuff is always changing because I'm always failing at one thing, realizing, oh shit, I should put that in a contract, right? So I don't get burned again. And my favorite one, uh, I don't know if he's in the room. Nope. But <clears throat> I added this thing called the pause clause. Does anybody have a pause clause? Nice. So the pause clause is when the client doesn't respond in X amount of days, there's a charge, right? Obvious, right? So obvious. Something that we went years without doing. And, one of the and that's one of the major things, right? We've been hit a lot of times, I'm sure many of you have. Again, staff changes, budget changes, or they're just like, I don't have time for this anymore. You're just the web people. We don't really care. We have bigger plans going on here, right? So a pause clause uh, and a solid contract uh, is super important. And the pause clause is, by the way, arbitrary numbers. If they don't respond in, uh, I think we have 14 days um, around a certain milestone, that if they don't respond in that, in that range, there's an upstart charge again, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, whatever it might be, to re-kick and restart the project. Yes. <laughs> uh, and it's, right, they sign it, uh, and it's, it's also, you know, you're keeping, it's overhead, right? It's overhead on the business. So if, you're, if you have a project sitting around, you have staging environments, you have GitHub accounts, you have to mentally keep that in mind. People who fall off, like we've had clients fall off 60, 90 days, especially over the holidays, it's, it's impossible to just like keep that stuff and then they call you up and say, we're ready to go again. Holidays are over, we're all back from vacation, let's kick this project, uh, start, get, get this project started again. There's gotta be a cost involved with that because you're pushing milestones away from us, we're not getting paid. This is my favorite, and this is something that, does anybody have a belief document? Very easy. This could be the simplest thing for your onboarding process. And these are the things that you just believe in as an agency. So all, like all the stuff and discussing how we need to be profitable because we need to survive <laughs> and we need to be there for you when you need another project built. Uh, the belief document sort of outlines all those things. Um, it could be one sheet. Ours is a slideshow, like I said, with the profit talk. It talks about our business, um, talks about us as, as founders, a father and son team, how long we've been in business, has some client testimonials in there, talks a little bit about uh, their project, really just gives an entry to um, you know, customers that just come in, cold leads or leads that contact you. We always follow up with our belief document. And there's a question in there that says, like, you know, have you read our favorite quote, which is um, the same one that Corey Miller uses, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, that kind of thing. And we say, did you get our favorite quote? And they'd be like, no, what quote? I'm like, you didn't read the belief document, did you? <laughs> and they're like, oh, I guess I didn't get that far. Uh, so we kind of use that as a gauge to see how uh, communicative, uh, communicative these clients will be. This one's kind of cool. We work with building, uh, we work with building a project charter uh, with our clients. It's just a loose 50,000 foot view of where we think the project will go uh, in a given time span. So again, if it's a 90 day pro or 60 day project, we'll sort of scope out and get them to sign off on the milestones that they'll also be responsible for, right? Gives them a global view of, hey, in four weeks, uh, design mockups will be done. This is where we think we're going to be in the project. Uh, it's not a hard date, but do these meetings make sense to you, Mr. or Mrs. Customer? Uh, do you think you'll be available at these points to have these discussions? And more importantly, will you have the decisions of these discussions done by the next project, right? So we bill uh, in sprints. So we'll do sprints and they'll have, to ch they'll have to pay their invoice before we proceed to the next sprint, right? So that's how we sort of uh, factor in our invoicing. This is just a great way to get them to understand where we'll be going. Comms, communication, that's the most obvious thing sort of what this whole thing is about. It's being as transparent and communicative to these clients as possible. It's super important. We use, uh, we used to use Basecamp, then we used to use Asana, then we <laughs> used to use something else that lasted like 30 days and we couldn't, we couldn't take it anymore. Uh, but now we're just using uh, Freshdesk, which is a support desk software. 
and you just get a ticket number, and we just track all of that uh, in that email. They can log in, they can see the paper trail of communication, share files, and all that stuff. It's just a great sort of email-based communication tool, right? It's simple, it's easy, it works for us. And then we get to the magic bullet, the thing that does it all, the number one ingredient in the secret sauce. Nope. <laughs> because there isn't, right? And when I go back to talk uh, earlier uh, in the discussion was what kind of agency are we? Boutique, high powered, who do we specialize in, right? So when we started seven, eight years ago, we said we did everything. We did photography, we did videography, we did graphic design, we did business cards, yes, right? And websites, of course, right? We printed out, this is back when like, people were still like, what's Facebook? Like, I can make a business on Facebook? So we printed out these things and it, we did social media management. That was like our, how do we do a cash grab to build a business, right? Throw the fishing net out there, see what we can scoop back in. So I think we did like four posts a month for $60. <laughs> it was just like stupid money, right? And we thought we would build a business that way. Um, and, we, and we couldn't. Over the years, we finally formed uh, the team to specialize in WordPress. That's where we started to devote our time. Now we specialize in higher ed, uh, traditional publishers like magazines and newspapers, uh, and business to business accounts. And over the course of time, you wish that there is a magic bullet to say no to work, but this is agency life, right? Agency life isn't as uh, beautiful as it always seems. To me, it's, that's the game. The game is finding out what you and your team can really rock out at and pursuing that particular client, building a business around those specialties. It's why, that you, can, it's why you can sign contracts for $1,500 websites or $15,000 websites or $50,000 websites. There's a, a dynamic in there of selling, understanding your client, knowing the way that they speak, and knowing what you can really do. If that makes sense. My name's Matt. I do something with a podcast on mattreport.com, and my agency is Slocum Studio. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, we have a, a clause in our contract. Uh, again, we're building everything on WordPress. We're not building any proprietary software except for a select few. Um, but until the uh, contract is complete, fully paid, then we reserve the rights to hold any of the custom, con or custom code that we've created. We don't have anything specific for content, um, but in the contract is once they're fully paid, everything is released to the client. Uh, but we're not doing anything proprietary in the sense that we would hold back anything else. Um, that's a great question. Um, again, all of our like the themes and everything we publish is GPL. If they decide to do that, that's totally up to them. Um, there's nothing that we're doing to sort of stop that. Most client, most of our clients would never go into that position. Although uh, we, where it is a concern, which again why these things are always dynamic and kind of go back to these things, is if they move on from us, now the, uh, the new agency has our work, right? And we've been in positions before where they've taken our, you know, our great code and they don't know what the hell they're doing with it. And they're like, how did you build that? Like, what plugin did you use? And like, we're not using a plugin, dude. Like, <laughs> this is all custom coded. Um, so it is a concern for an agency that might take that in the future, right? So it's a great concern. I don't know how to solve it yet. Yes. Yeah, so where does the pause clause come in? Uh, a majority of the time it has been from when they just simply disappear. 
and a lot of it has to do with, again, change of, changing of the guard in their company. Uh, and people, like, you know, our point of contacts are a lot of marketing people. Damn you all, right? <laughs> right? Because as soon as the holidays come, forget it. Right? These folks, like, they've already, you know, their budget's set. There's no problem. And now it's the holiday season, so their deadlines, it's not really super important to them. Right? Um, and that's just really where it comes in. It's just that they don't, they don't follow up on the timeline. Right? Um, and it's just not fair to us to have that pushed out. Right? So that's where it comes into effect. Absolutely. Right. I mean, th this is like, right. And, and that's why I call it the game, right? Because I don't know if anybody else is just getting leads every single day and you're closing them every single day. But every, like, I have a number I have to go make. And I'm the sales guy. I'm the business development guy. So I'm going to go out and keep selling and fill our pipeline to a manageable point. And like, great agencies are always like, what, two, three months away from going bankrupt, right? <laughs> because you're still getting in work and you need to get the work done. Uh, and they need to pay us on time, right? There's retainers and stuff like that. We're getting a little bit more into that um, as of late. But it's still a hustle. It's still, still making the work. So I thought there was another question over here. Oh, yes. Yes. That's a great question. Uh, I, you know, I get, I, it's always going to be, the answer is always like it depends, right? Um, so I get a bit, a bit of a rant. There's sort of people who really go with the value-based pricing. And you really have to take a step back and say, what type of client do I want to serve? So in higher ed, I'm not fooling anybody with value-based pricing. Right? <laughs> in the corporate world, I'm not fooling anybody with value-based pricing because they're doing RFPs, they have vendor, a uh, select vendor list, and if we're all going like, hmm, boy, if you're, you know, your sign-up is worth 50 bucks and you're doing 1,000 of those, boy, I, I should probably charge you over the course of a year like 75 grand. They're like, screw you, I can do this with a theme for 50 bucks and often monster, right? So in some cases, we're doing things, uh, depending on the client, do you want this, do you want this pool of, of hours? And it's whatever, $5,000, right? And within that pool, that's the retainer, we'll work out of that. Um, you know, otherwise, sometimes, like with publishers and marketers, they, they are sold on the value of just having a team that can get it done, right? And that's where the sort of salesmanship value stuff comes in, right? Uh, I had a lead, God, I hope they're not in this room. <laughs> this is so dangerous. So I had somebody email us the other day, and they were like, hey, we need help. Um, putting in meta tags and, and, or excuse me, page titles and uh, meta descriptions into our site. So I did a quick search, and they had like 200, index page, 200 indexed pages in Google. So I'm like, well, we, all right, how long is it gonna take? Like, so I asked them, I say, do you think you have, you need the research for t uh, page titles and meta descriptions? They're like, no, we already have that. We just need a team to implement it, implement it into our WordPress website. So I was like, all right. I'm like, I just wanna let you know that our minimum you know, fee is 5000 If you have other work, we'll set up a retainer, and we'll just pull from there. And they were like, no, I, I don't think you understand what we need. Can we ha have a phone call? I'm like, no problem. So I have the phone call. They're like, so I say, all 200 pages? You have another site somewhere? They're like, no, we only have 12 pages. I'm like, okay. 12 pa pages, $5,000. I say, what other work do you have? And they're like, no, 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 we don't want other work. We just need somebody there to do it. I was like, okay. So I give them a little spiel, a little sales dance. And then I say, then she says, one more time, it's 5000 a month, right? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's 5000 a month, yes. Right? So, and, and, and it's funny, uh, and it's not at the same time, because these people are going to want on-demand support for, those, for the next requests that come over time. So I say that, and it's not like, oh my god, look how much money you've just made, but I'm going to dedicate a developer to be there and, and manipulate our pipeline so we're not taking in other work that can, you know, stomp on that, right? So that's my little spiel on value-based. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned a lot of your, your projects are straight to your direct consumer clients. That's correct.
how it is with real estate expectations in life one for smart reads. Um, you know, depending on the size of that average or marketing or advertising agency, like they're it's their sales people. And you know, if they're just trying to get their sales people to change their pitch, or you can think about technology <coughs> for sitting in on the conversation. The problem is if you start sitting in on the conversation, you become they start looking at you as their top level problem manager and you don't want that. Right? Because now you're taking on the burden face-to-face -face client. Um, I don't have anything for sex in it. Uh, we don't do it anymore. But it's a great, I mean, it's a great way to not deal, have to deal with old former clients. Um, I would just try to find more agents to work with so clients can think of them, you know, through that. So I hope that helps.